this is a very important topic and we have a wonderful presenter. Uh, my name is Joelle Fishman. I chair the Political Action Commission of the Communist Party USA. Uh, I live here in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And I just got back from the tremendous mobilization uh, in Memphis, Tennessee of labor and clergy and community um, for justice and equality. And that is only one of the many, many expressions in the street that's uh, taking over our country from the dreamers to the um, high school students, to the striking teachers in, in red states, um, Black Lives Matter. Uh, but the, the thing is that being in the street isn't by itself going to make the change. And it has to be connected with actually organizing and getting out the vote and preventing that vote from be, being stolen. And so that preventing the vote from being stolen and asserting our right to vote is what uh, Joe Henry is going to be uh, addressing this evening. We're honored to have Joe Henry, who is the uh, Midwest Regional Director of LULAC and on the um, Iowa Executive Board of the American Civil Liberties Union. So Joe, welcome, and we're looking forward to the presentation. Okay, well, thank you all very, very much, Joelle and Dee. Uh, tonight's PowerPoint discussion you are going to be the first ones to get this PowerPoint. So excuse me for any uh, rambling that may happen, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go about 15 to 20 minutes through about 40 slides. And then after that, we're gonna go through a lot of discussion for the hour. Uh, we have an hour, right, Joelle? Yes. Okay, all right, here we go. And again, my name is Joe Henry with the League of United Latin American Citizens. Uh, I'm a national vice president. Uh, for the Midwest region. Uh, our LULAC organization uh, is the oldest and largest Latino civil rights organization in the country, founded in 1929. Civic engagement is one of the key elements of our organization. And when we look at voter suppression, voter ID, uh, the targeting of the populations for this is not the white population. It's the minority population, specifically the Latino population. I'm also glad to be here as a comrade. Uh, been around as a member since the 1980s, so it's very good to, to be here. Okay, let's get going. Hopefully everybody sees this on their screens. So voter suppression, voter ID, our rights under attack. Why, how, and when? Okay, you probably remember this one when Donald Trump said on November 27th, 2017, I won the popular vote, and if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally, if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. He was asked this uh, on an NBC, ABC interview. Let me get, I gotta move this stuff around, excuse me, hold on. Just a moment, gotta get that there. So when asked this in an ABC interview where Trump got that information, the president-elect's advisor, Kellyanne Conway, named Chris Kobach, Secretary of State for Kansas, as the source of the claim. Three days later, after Kobach certified the results of the 2016 election in Kansas at the Capitol in Topeka, he told reporters, I think the president-elect is absolutely correct when he says the number of illegal votes cast exceeds the popular vote margin between him and Hillary Clinton. This is Chris Kobach. And the reason that we're gonna kind of focus on him is Kobach is kind of the modern day uh, racist uh, doing voter ID. Uh, he's been around uh, visibly since 1992. Number of newspaper articles have been done on Chris Kobach. Uh, there's a New York Times article uh, going back from last year that I'll make sure that you get information on him. So we're gonna find more about Mr. Kobach and some other uh, folks as we go through these slides. Okay, Chris Kobach has, has enjoyed saying that he is the ACLU's worst nightmare. He likes to bill himself that way. Uh, in here it talks about he holds degrees from Harvard 
Oxford and Yale Law School. Uh, he had a radio talk show. Uh, he uh, likes to file lawsuits on his own within his state, and he's quite the deceiver. Okay, so voter ID to preserve Republican majorities and reduce the size and influence of the country's non-white po population. So Kobach's plan represents a radical reordering of American priorities. And his main goal is to help preserve Republican majorities by reducing the size and influence of the country's non-white population, advocate voting restrictions that make it easier for Republicans to win, using those elements as a vehicle for implementing policies to protect the interests and aims of a shrinking white majority. Part of the new, he's also part of the new nativist movement that is rapidly gaining influence, not just in the United States, but across the globe. Of course, we saw that in Britain, we see that in Europe. So what is the narrative? Deceitful foreigners subverting democracy, making people believe that voter fraud is rampant, builds public support for policies that restrict access to the ballot. Claims of illegal voting by non-citizens to help justify his hardline anti-immigrant immigration agenda. The story Kobach tells about voter fraud is what persuaded Trump to create a presidential commission on election integrity and name Kobach as its vice chairman. You heard a lot about this uh, commission uh, a year ago. There was a lot of talk and articles done on it. He stated his own view publicly, which is consistent with what he's told me privately, Kopech says about Trump's views on voter fraud. He believes that it's a significant problem. Of course, we hear this over and over again. So Trump's voter fraud commission was formed last year. Um, we talked in, in that voter fraud uh, commission, Certain devices that he that he has uh, that they have promoted the systematic alien verification for entitlements. This uh, this program has been used in many states that have uh, instituted voter ID. We're going to hear more about this. There's a lawsuit actually going on right now in Iowa, but that is one of the main key things. Uh, Kobach also talks about the National Voter Registration Act and the Voters Right Voter Voting Rights Act. They were enacted in the 1960s, but he, but as he talks about it and in his narrative, he accuses the ACLU of distorting that, and he has attempted to use those laws in a different way, basically turning it upside down. And now with those two laws, then he tries to promote uh, proof of citizenship laws to be adopted in every state. And this is something that, of course, he has created in his own state, Kansas, because Chris Kobach is still the Secretary of State in Kansas. Okay, uh, some interesting history about Kobach. He became a protege of Professor Samuel Huntington, then the director of Harvard's Center for International Affairs. Um, two of the themes, uh, let's go down here, uh, where, uh, Kobeck wrote in a senior thesis on how the movement to divest from South Africa was misguided because international businesses were already leading the way against apartheid, he stated. Uh, he felt that Huntington, who had advised South Africa's government, argued that a transition away from white minority rule might require a period of enlightened despotism. Notice the narrative. Kobeck says Huntington touched on a lot of themes that he's worked, um, that he has used to work on immigration law, but he's also distanced himself from Huntington uh, with some more radical ideas. So we're gonna see some more here in the next slide. Two, two elements that uh, was used in Kovacs thesis regarding Huntington or Huntington's central thesis was that the country's Anglo-Protestant culture was under siege, number one. Huntington warned that the large and continuing influx of Hispanics threatens the preeminence of white Anglo-Protestant culture and the place of English as the only national language. White nativist movements are a possible and plausible response to these trends, he states. Five years later, in another essay in Foreign Policy, he amplified the point, stating, demographically, socially, and culturally, culturally, the Reconquista, 
of the Southwest United States by Mexican immigrants is well underway, end of quote. Huntington warned of the dangers of expanding the franchise to previously disenfranchised and marginalized groups of voters. In itself, this marginality on the part of some groups is inherently undemocratic, but it has also been one of the factors which has enabled democracy to function effectively, Huntington wrote. Marginal social groups, as in the case of the Blacks, are now becoming full participants in the political system. Yet the danger of overloading the political system with demands which extends its functions and undermine its authority still remains. Number two of his beliefs, the changing demographics of the United States would lead to a culture war between Anglo-Protestants and newer immigrant groups, particularly Latinos. Quote, while Muslims pose the immediate problem in, to Europe, end of quote, Huntington wrote in his 1996 book, quote again, the clash of civilizations, quote again, Mexicans pose a problem for the United States, end of quote. Huntington expanded on this view in, the two, in his 2004 book, Who Are We? The Challenges to America's National Identity, denouncing the Hispanization of the United States and claiming that many Mexican-American immigrants do not appear to identify primarily with the United States and were often contemptuous of America cult American culture. So this is the narrative that has been promoted since the 1990s both through Kobach and Huntington, his mentor. Kobach, of course, stating on this slide, uh, enrolled at Yale Law School in 92. Uh, he was a supporter of Proposition 187. We all remember that. Uh, Kobach states that it was not Huntington so much as Proposition 187 that sparked his interest in immigration law, uh, which is going to be another element of voter ID. Kobach ends up going to the Bush administration. In 2001, Kobach took a leave of absence from his job at, as a law professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, to become a White House fellow in the George Bush administration. He was assigned to the Justice Department a week before September 11th, while much of the national security establishment regarding the attacks as an intelligence failure. Kobach viewed them as a failure of border security adding this to his narrative. Mark Johnson, a partner at Denton's law firm in Kansas City who has known Kobach for 25 years, states that this radicalized him on issues of immigration. Kobach, chief, he became chief advisor on immigration and border security uh, under Attorney General John Ashcroft. Uh, during that time, he uh, one of his first tasks was to implement the National Security Entry Exit Registration System that involved uh, looking at male visa holders over the age of 16 and from 16 to 24, predominantly Muslim from Muslim countries in North Korea to be fingerprinted, photographed, and interviewed by immigration authorities. The program was controversial inside and out. ACLU took on this issue. Uh, and stated in meeting this stated that it mandated ethnic profiling on a scale not seen in the United States since the Japanese American internment during World War II and Operation Wetback Deportations to Mexico of 1954. The Obama administration halted this program in 2011. Uh, this program did not result in a single known conviction on terrorism charges, but it did result in the deportation proceedings for nearly 14,000 Muslim men, many for minor immigrations. Kobach regarded this as a great success. Kobach also worked with Joe Arpaio uh, to enforce federal immigration law. And during this time, as we see in this slide, and you'll receive a copy of it, he used that time uh, to, to work on uh, a program for voter ID that we later saw after this effort to prove proof of citizenship. Uh, down here it says that the Justice Department, Kobach, had promoted an effort to deputize local police departments 
with Immigration Enforcement Authority from Immigration and Custom Enforcement in 2007. Arpaio received such a deputization in his office within two years had arrested 33,000 undocumented immigrants, many of them in highly publicized crime suppression sweeps. What's interesting about this part, and you're probably wondering why did I throw it in there? Basically, Kobach and others in the nativist movement with a pile were using this, whipping up this frenzy that immigrants were uh, registering to vote. Uh, therefore, they had a program to prove uh, citizenship. So during this time he, that he was doing this, he was gathering more information that he could use later on within state courts and then take it to a federal level to attempt to change voter laws throughout the country. The Interstate Voter Registration Cross-Check Program was one of the things that he began to, to use in Kansas, where he is Secretary of State, in Midwestern states. This Interstate Voter Registration Cross-Check Program compares state records to find people richer to vote in more than one places. As you read through this, what happened with this, so the program searches for double registration using only voters, voters' first name and last names and date of birth, and it generates thousands of false positives. Now, we've seen this in many, many states, of course, state I come from. Programs like this have been used to kick out people who are actually real registered voters. In here, let's see, it was a list of more than 57,000 voters that he attempted to purge that were supposedly registered in other states. The data was littered with errors, according to Lawrence Hawk, then the registrar in Chesterfield County, uh, told the Richmond Times Dispatch, we need to do an interstate checking mechanism, but I'm not real impressed with this one. Here we have more information on the um, this, uh, this type of program has kicked out many, many minorities. 7% uh, of Americans, mostly minorities, do not have these documents readily available to prove citizenship to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, switching to another thing here. Uh, one of the other things that Kobach did during this time, along with Crosscheck, was to, in, to instill within his state law proof of citizenship, voter ID, and both of these elements uh, made it more difficult for minorities to prove that they were either a citizen uh, and also whether or not they were actually registered to vote. Uh, so he threw these programs into place within his own state, promoted it across the country afterwards. Um, in here states, despite these claims, documented cases of non-citizens voting are extremely rare. A study of all 50 states between 2001 to 2012, found only 633 reported cases of voter fraud, and only 10 of those were from voter impersonations. Opponents of voter ID laws argue that any benefits gained by voter ID laws are not worth the risk of reduced voter turnout and disenfranchisement. Um, as many of you remember from decades ago, you did not have to prove that you were the citizen of the United States. Uh, all you had to prove was that you had residence uh, within your community and you did not have to provide a photo ID. So providing the photo ID and then proof of citizenship, actually having to carry around your birth certificate were things that none of us uh, had to deal with back in the 80s or 90s. Down here, while Republican lawmakers ostensibly support voter ID laws on the grounds that they want to prevent voter fraud, the lack of evidence of such fraud makes this reasoning suspect. Okay, we'll go to the next one. So uh, going back to, again, what Kobach did in Kansas uh, with proof of citizenship, uh, he then instituted what was called the, the Secured and Fair Elections Act. And of course, it started in Kansas. And then he promoted this on a national level, advocating at national conferences on and also on radio talk shows, the need to have proof of citizenship along with a photo ID. Uh, and then of course, while Kansas was not the first state to pass a voter ID law, uh, 
which was originally done in South Carolina in 1950. The Kansas law was and remains one of the most restrictive and comprehensive laws of its kind. The SAFE Act requires voters to present photo IDs prior to casting a ballot, present a full driver's license number, and have their signatures verified in order to absentee vote and provide proof of citizenship to register to vote. Although a few states had previously adopted one or two of these provisions, Kansas was the first to combine all three. In an interview, Kovac defended the law, stating every time an alien votes, it cancels out the vote of a United States citizen. Arguably, the most restrictive provisions of the Kansas SAFE Act is its requirement that people show a birth certificate, U.S. passport, or other documents showing citizenship before they can register to vote. Um, if any of the people on this uh, conference call have been involved in any uh, state uh, legislative work um, in their own state uh, within the last year, you probably have heard of these type of items popping up by uh, conservatives at state houses. Okay, of course, Kobach, uh, along with many others in his group, have tried to make the SAFE Act into a sustainable model of election legislation. I'm not gonna go into this information, but you'll be able to read about this. This type of legislation proposals are being popped up around the country, and this is throwing a lot of voters out of the ability to vote by having to prove all these elements. Legislation to restrict voting access. Overall, at least 99 bills to restrict access to registration and voting have been introduced in 31 states. 35 such bills saw significant legislative action, meaning they have at least approved at the committee level or beyond in 17 states. Five states have already enacted such laws. Iowa, which we'll go over later on, Arkansas, North Dakota, Indiana, Montana, Georgia, in different forms. The Iowa voter ID bill passed in 2017, despite lack of any evidence of electoral improprieties, some state officials have promoted and stoked false and misleading reports of improper voting. Despite the lack of any evidence of electoral improprieties, some state officials have promoted and stoked false and misleading reports of improper voting. This is part and partial of a concerted strategy to implement policies that would make it more difficult for Iowans in general, and in particular racial and language minorities, women and young, old and disabled, and Democratic voters to exercise their right to vote. Indeed, in justifying attempts to adopt restrictive voter identification measures and to purge Iowa's voter rolls, former Secretary of State Matt Schultz implicitly admitted um, in a conversation he had with the media uh, that the real purpose of these efforts was to further a specific political agenda by making it more difficult for voters likely to oppose that agenda to participate in the political process. He actually made that uh, statement at a, at a Republican fundraiser in Iowa two years, let me see, five years ago. Uh, enhancing voter ID and election integrity was necessary, he said, to advance a whole lot of issues that we care about such as abortion, gay marriage, a whole lot of social issues that we care about defeating. Obviously, imposing restrictive voting laws has nothing substantially to do with abortion, gay marriage, or other social issues. The only logical interpretation of this statement is that the restrictive voting laws he was promoting would benefit a certain partisan agenda by disproportionately reducing the turnout of voters unlikely to support that agenda. It is no coincidence that these efforts have occurred during the period in which Iowa's population has become significantly more diverse. From 1980 to 2000, the Latino population in Iowa more than tripled. By 2010, um, it has nearly doubled again. From 1980 to 2010, the African American population of Iowa more than doubled. And the state's Asian American population increased nearly fivefold during the same period. Thereby, thereby decreasing the power of the white vote. The, Repub the, the rapid diversification of Iowa's population has been even more pronounced in urban areas such as Des Moines, whereas, whereas of 2010, the Latino population has come to constitute a full 12% of the population, and African Americans had come to account for over 10% of the population. 
Voter ID bills are still the most common form of voter restriction moving in state legislatures since 2010. 10 states have passed more burdensome voter ID requirements. Legislation pending in other states poses risk uh, for, for voting access. Oklahoma is used as an example. Restrictions on voter registration are a close second after voter ID, making the voter registration process more burdensome. Burdensome is the most popular subject of bills to cut back on voting access. And here it talks about the number of bills, of course, you'll receive in an email. So the majority of states acting to restrict voter, voter restrict voting are legislating on topics where courts previously acted to protect voters. So the conservative agenda has been going after states that had more progressive ways in which people could vote uh, more lenient. So this is where um, the conservatives are going. Arkansas, Georgia, Iowa, North Dakota. Texas, of course, was already conservative, but even more uh, restrictive voter ID legislation has been moved forward. Here's just some graphs, which you'll get a copy of later on. Uh, basically saying the same thing, but naming the bills that were used in those states of Arkansas, Georgia, Indiana, Iowa, Montana, North Dakota. Bills to enhance voter access approved by state legislatures. So the good news is on the flip side, in other states, bills to enhance voter access have been approved in Idaho, Indiana, Kansas, Maryland, Believe it or not, certain part of Kansas, Maryland, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Utah, Virginia, Wyoming. Uh, another thing that has happened since Trump has um, been elected was calling voter rolls, battling over who even gets to go to the polls. Uh, in this first paragraph, on its face, the notice sent out to 248 county election officials Ask only that they do what Congress has ordered, prune their voter, voter, prune their roles of voters who had died, moved, or lost their eligibility, or face a federal lawsuit. These conservative groups have sent these letters out to uh, many counties in many states throughout the country, urging conservative auditors of counties to prune their voter roles, to restrict the, um, to restrict the amount of voters that are considered active by reducing the time that they would be considered to be kept on the voter rolls, meaning such things as if that voter had not voted within the last four years, even though they may still live in that state, if they had not voted for some reason, they would be removed from the active voter rolls. Uh, if this was also, uh, they did a comparison as stated before on an immigrant uh, data uh, website uh, to determine whether or not their name coincided with an immigrant who was using some sort of federal program, they would remove their name. Back in 2000, this type of uh, pruning the voter rolls or calling was used uh, in Florida during the 2000 presidential election right beforehand where they were reducing the number of registered voters by stating, again, if, if a person had not voted over a several year period, that they would be removed from the voter rolls. What does that do when people are removed as active voters from the vote, voting rolls? Uh, when they are removed from the voting rolls, uh, political campaigns cannot access those voters to provide them with information on their candidates running for office. And of course, when that is not happening and, and people are not reached out to through campaigns, then they may be less likely to vote um, in the next election. The other element of that is if they're not noted as an active voter, then when it's time for them to vote, if they do want to vote, even if they had not been contacted by a political campaign, when they go in to vote, their names are not shown on the uh, voter rolls at that specific precinct, and then they have to protest their right to vote. And of course, many people, uh, when they have to prove that they are richer to voter and they're there to vote on election day, a number of those folks, a uh, certain amount, certain percentage, high in some areas, especially impacting minorities, uh, choose not to vote 
which is very unfortunate. So again, by pruning or calling the voter rolls and eliminating them from those voter lists, even though eventually they could prove that they are uh, residents of that particular state, that they are citizens, uh, it reduces the number, therefore it plays into the conservative agenda. Voting right advocates and most democratic elected officials in turn say that the benefits are mostly imaginary and that the purge, purges are intended to reduce the number of minority, poor, and young voters who are disproportionately Democrats or voting Democrat. The goal here is not election integrity. According to Stuart Knightiff, the senior counsel on the voting rights group, uh, and I believe he was with the ACLU, stated it's intimidation and suppression of, vote, of voters. And again, if you are registered to vote, but if you haven't voted for some reason over a certain period of time, or if your name had been identified, it, identified with uh, the name of an immigrant who only has legal residence but is not a U.S. citizen, and then you have to prove uh, your residency and your citizenship, uh, it is intimidation and suppression. Okay, here it goes through a number of groups, which I'm, you can read this later on. A number of these groups, uh, the Public Interest Legal Foundation, Judicial Watch, Judicial Watch, the American Civil Rights Union, not the ACLU, rely on former lawyers in the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division who came from the George Bush administration, then also the True Vote. These groups, which this last one's part of the Tea Party, have been, these groups have gone from state to state to argue their case, to, to argue for voter ID, and to, to use what Kobach and others had uh, established uh, within their own states early on as a way to reduce the power of the minority vote. Uh, so these groups go from state to state, they have conferences, they use their narrative, it's a native, nativist narrative, it's a conservative narrative, and again, they go from state to state and they are impacting our right to vote and reducing the number of registered voters from state to state. Uh, here, I'm not going to go through this. We've kind of talked about this. Here's something very interesting. This database, here we have another database. Voters with similar or identical names compound the odds, odds of accidental delisting. The University of Pennsylvania study found that, found that of 125 million voter registration files from 2012, found that some of three million registrants shared common first names, last names, and date of birth. Again, when Kobach and others have used the, um, the programs that were stated earlier and only rely upon first name, last name, and date of birth, they kick out a lot of false positives in those particular states. And unless there is an ACLU or another uh, voter rights group to take them on, uh, in the state legislature and in the state courts, then those voter ID laws stay in effect and millions of people get kicked off the voter rolls in every state. This is a little more stuff here. Aggressive, other examples of consequences of aggressive purges are not hard to find in Florida, again in 2004 and 2012 and in Georgia, which ended a program in September that had canceled on marked for purging roughly 35,000 registered voters, two thirds of them African-American. That purge was based on data matching, on a data matching program that had flagged registration for errors as niggling as missing apostrophes or misplaced hyphens. So again, we see the danger of using these programs, very weak programs for kicking out people. And then it's up to the voter to prove that they're actually the real person and that they they should be registered to vote. Voting right advocates say the purge efforts fall in partisan line with their other court battles over voting restrictions imposed by Republican governments. Amicus brief supporting partisan gerrymandering occurred in Wisconsin, North Carolina. Uh, voter restriction later found to have violated the 14th Amendment and voter writing, vote, Voting Rights Act and a Kansas rule that imposed proof of citizenship requirements on new registration for state elections. Here, uh, 
Again, a little morphine of the proof of citizenship requirement. What we see across the country, and again, this happened in Iowa, was uh, establishing this proof of citizenship requirement, not on existing voters, but on any new voters coming uh, uh, that would register to vote uh, a year after this new legislation would take effect, which again would make it very hard for many people to find their birth certificate and so far, so far very, very hard. Uh, Trump administration Justice Department um, has been changing a lot on how it fights for voters. It's actually gone in reverse. Ohio has had a very uh, aggressive voter ID uh, legislation. And unlike the Obama administration, which worked to expand the rights of voters, uh, now under Trump, uh, we find in Ohio, where again, they have very strong voter ID law, they have joined uh, with Ohio in supporting Ohio's restrictive voter ID by filing an amicus brief on behalf. Okay, now for the good news. There's also been efforts across the country to expand voting access. Overall, at least 531 bills have been put forth in 45 states. Uh, 15 state legislatures have passed bills to expand access to voting. Um, but in some states, governors have vetoed the most impactful legislation. Eight states have created, have enacted bills that will make voting registration easier. Seven states have not yet enacted. Uh, we look at Florida, Kansas, New Jersey, Tennessee, Utah, and Virginia enacted legislation that would make it easier to vote without showing up at the polls on election day. So this would be absentee voting. New Jersey has done some effort for military voters. Utah on absentee voting, Indiana has improved some access, Wyoming has eased the process for restoring the right to vote for people with criminal convictions. Um, when we look at what happened in Iowa and elsewhere, uh, actually when it came to uh, uh, voters uh, who had been, who had committed a felony, then their rights were taken away uh, and we see a rollback in other areas. So, so forth and so on, we see good news happening to expand in other areas. Um, automatic registration and other reforms to modernize voter rolls are common forms of legislation to expand voter access. We've seen this occur, good news, in the District of Columbia, Illinois, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Connecticut, Georgia. Uh, we've also seen this happen, of course, as you all were, in Washington, uh, uh, Maine, Maryland, Nebraska. And again, we notice Illinois and so forth and so on. So we have seen this automatic registration, which is the most common sense way, totally opposite of voter ID. This way, somebody becomes 18, they automatically get registered to vote. It's a no brainer. All the information is provided by the Secretary of State, along with other state uh, departments, not a problem at all. So this is a solution to fighting voter ID. Okay, legislation restoring the right to vote uh, to people with past convictions uh, is also common. We've actually seen some good news in Nebraska and Wyoming, uh, Nevada, Virginia, over 55 bills help restore the right to vote to persons with past criminal convictions has been introduced in 18 states and it's been improved in committees to go to state legislatures in 17 states. Uh, legislation has also um, been proposed to expand early and absentee voting um, in a number of states, overall 166 bills to improve early voting or absentee voting access have been introduced in 35 states. But at the same time, we've seen conservative groups reduce the amount of time for absentee voting. So there has been a tug of war on this going back and forth. Um, now we'll get down to the last part of the PowerPoint. Uh, we have some national lawsuits that are underway right now. Uh, LULAC, my organization, is part of one that uh, is focused on the Electoral College. We have the popular vote, and then we have the Electoral College. And as we're well aware, the Electoral College has been used to determine who the president will be. Uh, st stated in here, uh, we have an argument that is being used in the four lawsuits 
uh, California and Texas are two of the states, I believe Massachusetts and another one where these lawsuits were presented uh, last month. Uh, but the argument that's used by the attorneys, um, the David Boyce Law Firm and the attorneys for LULAC is we argue that by magnifying the impact of some votes and disregarding others, the winner take all system as it exists right now, as we know in every state, is, only, is not only undemocratic, but it also violates the constitutional rights of free association, political expression, and equal protection under the law. These suits aim to restore those rights nationwide. For example, Texas. Texas has always been known as a red state, uh, even though now we know, uh, especially from 2016, 40% of the voters in Texas in 2016 voted for Hillary Clinton, but none of the electoral votes went for Hillary Clinton. It was a winner take all system. So all the votes from that state, and I believe there were 35 electoral votes in that state, 35 to 38, all went for Trump. Uh, under this lawsuit, if, if it can be won in the federal courts in Texas, then what that would state would be, would require proportionate representation of the electorates. The electorates would be bound to vote by proportion of how the popular vote went, which would have meant that a portion of the 38 electorates would have voted would have had to have voted for Hillary Clinton instead of Trump. This would have an amazing impact. And it, my opinion is we should just get rid of the Electoral College. But because there's an argument that the Electoral College is part of the Constitution, that we can't get rid of it, we only can modify it, but we can make sure that it represents the true intent of the Constitution. So these, this lawsuit is underway. Again, it's in four states. Um, this will be heard at some point by the Supreme Court. So this will be very interesting, and we'll see if it, um, a decision is actually made before the 2020 uh, election, next presidential election. Uh, there's a lawsuit underway that uh, our, our organization is part of, and we're working with the ACLU here in Iowa to go after this stringent voter ID bill that was passed here in Iowa. Again, we are stating that it violates not only uh, the federal constitution, but the state of Iowa constitution. It disenfranchises uh, many minorities. It's burdensome. It, it requires too much. They have the photo ID to prove citizenship. There is a part of it where the, uh, the poll, um, the volunteers at the polls are allowed to determine whether or not the signature uh, that is signed off by the voter matches the signature that's on the voter rolls, which is uh, very subjective and would kick, off, kick out a lot of false positives on that. So that lawsuit uh, will be uh, submitted uh, within the coming weeks. Um, good news is the Voter Fraud Commission that was established by Trump a year ago uh, Trump has decided to disband uh, his voter fraud commission. He did that on January 3rd. Uh, he issued an executive order to dissolve the controversial voter fraud commission before it could issue any final report. Uh, the president's decision to disband the group followed months of controversy and legal challenges from civic groups, including the Brennan Center. President Trump initially created the presidential, blah, 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 blah. we already talked about that. Uh, so that is the good news. The battles are underway. The ACLU and many other groups are part of those battles. We at LULAC are part of those battles. So at the end of the day, voter ID, voter suppression, the only purpose is, is to reduce the number of voters. The attack is mainly on the minority community, uh, and most of which my belief is, is on the Latino community. That's why we see these attacks on immigrants right now, which goes hand in hand with the voter ID. Uh, when you see Trump whipping up, build the wall, attacking immigrants, that's playing into the hands of the voter ID laws that are being enacted. So we're seeing this happen. The narrative is there. You hear this narrative when you're in um, 
at the state legislatures when these bills are being proposed by uh, the Republicans. It's a very dangerous time uh, with the amount of racism, but racism is being again used for the sole purpose of the conservative vote. So we have to fight this battle on many different fronts, both legally within the state legislatures and of course in the federal courts, but we're also gonna see the federal courts become more conservative as Trump is able to appoint more conservative judges. So we have that going against us in the long run. So the battles on a legal front can only be won in the future by also making sure that our people turn out on election days. Uh, we, we, of course, within the minority communities are working very hard to get many of our voters registered to vote and also to prepare when they go to vote on how they can argue to make sure that they can defend themselves especially if their names have been taken off the voter rolls for whatever reason, due to some of these programs that have been enacted by Kobach and other conservatives to uh, wipe their names off the voter files, which is something that uh, for those of you who have not heard about that before, might be a little bit hard to understand, but you would realize the reality if you went to vote on election day and you found out that your name wasn't on the voter rolls, but yet you had voted there before or at some time before. And then they asked you to prove it. That is a very dangerous thing. So we're fighting very hard, excuse me, for some of the rough points on this PowerPoint, but I think now it's time for discussion. So you can ask me about all those different things I rambled on that might not have made sense. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, now we will open the floor for uh, discussion. Uh, if you have a comment or questions, uh, please use your raised hand icon. Just click it with your mouse and we will see an indication that you wish to speak and we will open your mic. Irving, your mic is open, so you have to click your mic on your end. Irv, there you yeah, are. I got it. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for such a wonderful and in-depth uh, voter um, uh, registration uh, presentation. Um, the thing is, is that I guess the mo the best way to counter this, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to pri probably have more and more uh, individual um, Communist Party members in each and every state to, uh, to fight back um, the various sections of negative legislation and to promote uh, a more positive voter registration. Uh, another thing that possibly can be done is also pressuring a, a Congress that might be uh, pressuring for a Congress that might be more um, uh, amenable to our position uh, to enact a uh, stronger voter rights um, uh, act law. I agree. I agree. Yes, we, we, we do need to make sure that Congress does more. And of course, we know that that is going to be difficult in, until we get uh, uh, more progressives elected in Congress, and and you're you're quite right. I and mean, we the comrades really need to be out there to discuss this narrative and to fight back uh, this battle that's happening to uh, enact these voter ID bills and make them more stricter and to use these programs that are actually very simple, very stupid programs uh, to, to to throw people off the voter rolls. Uh, this battle right now is being fought by attorneys and a number of nonprofit groups. Uh, the, the discussion on the falsehoods of, of what is being implemented needs to be expanded. The discussion needs to be happening at the union halls, uh, in nonprofit uh, meetings across, uh, uh, of course, in the minority group, uh, nonprofit groups. We need to discuss this. This is not, it's not rocket science to, uh, to explain that many false positives are being promoted here. Uh, that the reality is uh, this uh, fight to uh, to make uh, voting more safe, it's not true. I mean, people people would not commit a felony to, to vote if they, uh, they would not, immigrants don't go voting. Uh, these fears are being whipped up 
uh, just to promote a false narrative. So I agree with you. Okay, again, if you'd like to introduce a question uh, or comment, please use your raised hand icon so that uh, we can open up your mic. Emil, your mic is open. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Joe, thank you so much. That was an extremely uh, comprehensive and, and uh, enlightening presentation. And I hope we see a written version at some point. Uh, just to add, uh, there are little things that the right wing does uh, in addition to the ones you mentioned. Uh, one I'm dealing with in my neighborhood right now is the way they distribute the polling places in geographically so that people who don't have automobiles and who have to go and vote, for instance, with children in tow or, or older or sick, uh, basically can't get to the polls. And that's one we have to fight on locally. What I've tried to do is to get people in my area to do carpooling on election day. But uh, it's not been terribly successful, mostly because we really don't have long-term community organizations around here to do that. But I think uh, uh, also related to what the previous commentator said, we communists need to be looking at the grassroots organizing work in the minority communities where the efforts to suppress the work are taking place and create strong local organizations of working class minority and non-minority people in those areas and then that way you can accompany people to the polls you can get people to the polls you can also do battle with local officials or, or elect election officials who try and, and thwart democracy by blocking the vote and thanks again for your presentation Thank you, thank you, Emil. Yeah, it's uh, thank you very much. Um, what what is happening? It's it's very interesting. The uh, um, many progressives, uh, union activists, uh, social justice activists, rely upon information that's provided to them by the Democratic Party and other progressive groups. What's unfortunate, though, is that the Democratic Party and other progressive groups have relied upon consultants to give them information. But that, is, that has become diluted. That's very hard to get these days. We see um, several different entities working together right now. We have the Secretary of State of every state, which has the complete list of voter registration records. And they do certain things based upon state laws. Along with that, every Secretary of State has its county auditors. The county auditors are the keeper of the original voter files within our state. That is where the battle needs to be fought. It's on a county by county level uh, to make sure that the voter rolls are protected. There are ways in which we as activists, as comrades, could start getting access to those voter rolls to make sure that our people, our activists, are on those voter rolls, that the right information is uh, noted on those uh, in those data files, and that we need to take that power, that information, away from the political campaigns and into the hands of activists, specifically in the labor movement, to help educate them on how to gain access to those voter rolls, and then also talk with those county auditors, as you state a mill, where those polling locations are, and to make sure that comrades are also those paid volunteers that are the poll uh, volunteers. In many states, those people at the polls who take your names, who give you the ballot, are paid by the county, sometimes up to a couple hundred dollars a day or more to be there to help uh, voters when they come in. We need to play a part in that and get that knowledge and, and get that information out to people. And again, to find out what the Secretary of States are doing with their voter voter rolls and to participate in state legislatures. Thank you. Mark, your mic is open. Yeah, uh, this is Mark, Mark G in Washington. Um, the problem is that outside the minority community and possibly some college towns and, the, and maybe some areas with high elderly populations, this is an issue that's below the radar. 
So the, my question is, or my comment is, is that how to create a mass movement and it, you know, to use the old radio slogan, keep it simple, we have to sort of create a simple slogan saying the right wing is trying to take away your right to vote. If you want change, you've got to fight back. And then once you get them in, just by that simple slogan, then you give them all the background and send them out. Uh, any suggestions for how we can create such a mass movement to get this up? Yes, I have a very inexpensive way of doing it. The power is on the precinct level. Your okay. precinct, everybody lives in a precinct. It is your right as, as a registered voter or non-registered voter is to go to your county auditor office, your county election office, and to request a copy, usually in Excel, of all the registered voters in your precinct, in your county, throughout. You can have that information of everybody who's registered to vote, uh, gender, date of birth, uh, party affiliation, and how many times they voted over the years. That information will give you the power to, to work with other registered voters in your precinct it's a no-brainer. You can use that file to do mailings, to do phone calling, to encourage people to become members of the party. Uh, it doesn't take much. Usually these precinct uh, files only cost anywhere from $50 to $100 to pick up a precinct file of hundreds of registered voters. We need to be doing this because that is where the identification of the people who have the power right now to vote. We need to really, quite frankly, we need to go away from just voter registration, from just encouraging people to vote to, to the registered voters, because it's the registered voters who are gonna decide on election day, out of their precinct, out of their county, out of their district, who's the next person to get elected on whatever level. We need to use those voter files. So I would, I would encourage a mass movement of working on those voter files to reach out to voters with our message in whatever form you want to use it for, going door to door. Okay, last call. Um, if you'd like to introduce a question or uh, a comment, please uh, indicate using your raised hand icon now. Joelle, did you want to uh, I would like to uh, say a couple of things. I don't want to cut off if there's another person raising their hand. Um, but anyway, I'll go ahead. You know, on this last point about making, um, well, first of all, I want to thank very much uh, Joe Henry. And uh, I should have said in the beginning that uh, we collaborate together on the Political Action Commission. Uh, I left that out of your, your um, credits there, but we're very fortunate for that. And I want to appreciate the um, uh, uh, sharing of the ideological foundations uh, to this um, uh, racist present day poll tax kind of um, effort uh, to prevent people, especially working class people and uh, African-American, Latino, elderly youth uh, to be able to have their their right to vote um, and uh, the use of the anti-immigrant fervor to try and um, um, project this. I wanted to mention Reverend William Barber and what's happened in North Carolina uh, in reference to the idea of building a mass movement. And I agree entirely that um, we everybody has to be involved uh, in their, whether it's called a precinct or a ward, or in Connecticut, we don't have counties. Each state has a little bit of difference, but the idea that um, Joe Henry was putting forward there. But um, uh, Reverend Barber in North Carolina, I think built a movement that is a model, and he's now uh, leading the Poor People's Campaign um, around uh, these voter ID and other voter suppression methods that were being used in North Carolina. And he interconnected that um, with the fact that the, um, the state was refusing a Medicare, Medicaid expansion and uh, other needs so that the voting rights 
became an integral part of all of the demands and issues uh, that are being organized around uh, in North Carolina. And that's his message today, is that all of these movements have to be interconnected uh, in order for us to get ahead. And I, I did want to make another point, which is um, uh, in the uh, PowerPoint, it showed um, uh, how votes uh, were affected in, in past years. But in this uh, 2006, uh, in the 2016 presidential election, if you look at some of the states that um, uh, seem to be surprisingly go Republican, um, for example, in Wisconsin, uh, had just newly um, enforced uh, voter suppression methods that greatly impacted um, the uh, African American and Latino community uh, in uh, Milwaukee. And the number of votes, less votes that were able to be cast in Milwaukee was far greater than the difference that Trump carried the state. So I think I'm correct. Joe can can correct me if if I um, if you're if, correct. Okay. So it shows, but it also in North Carolina, where some of those uh, have been defeated, turned around, uh, that it does have to be something that's both in the courts and on the streets. Um, and and we've learned that for. For many years, I first learned it when Angela Davis was in prison and the whole free Angela Davis campaign, it was very explicitly, we're fighting in the courts and we're fighting on the streets. We're having a mass education um, approach. And um, this is our very, it's the most basic for, uh, aspect of democracy, your right to vote. And so um, the uh, information that uh, has been provided to us tonight is very valuable uh, and we really need to take it and spread it and be very involved in our local um, ward, precinct and state level uh, to, um, to uh, shine a light and, and place a high priority upon um, ending voter suppression and ID laws. So thank you, Joe. Thank you. Okay, uh, Joe, if you'd like to make any closing uh, remarks, please do. Okay, well, thank you all for, for being on this uh, workshop, conference call. Uh, this, this was the first time uh, that I gave this presentation, so there was lots of information there. Uh, I'm going to send this PDF of, of the PowerPoint, that, or I'm going to just actually send the PowerPoint over to Joelle. Uh, in D. So anybody who wants it, please take it, gather information. Uh, my information came from uh, the Brennan uh, group and also the New York Times and, and another in the ACLU. So uh, all of it can be documented. You can do further research. Uh, but this is very important. And, and, this, and this, this is where it's at. This is where the rubber hits the road. It's on the voter engagement. And again, I would encourage people to focus the battle um, on the Richard voters right now. That is key, and that's who the Republicans are going after. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Please uh, uh, thank you, Joe and, and Joelle, especially uh, to the uh, participants. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you'll join us uh, uh, in our upcoming classes. The next class will be April 22nd, on state and revolution. So thank everyone for joining us tonight and good night. Good night. Bye.